With stem cell science, we can look at our genes as never before to find cures and to understand how our genes make us human. What makes us human is a question that not only science asks, but all disciplines of mind, from philosophy to religion, to sociology and ethics, and even to storytelling and the arts. The motion picture William, a story about a Neanderthal living among modern humans, poses the question, what is human? So I brought together a panel of different experts to discuss the many issues of humanness that this story raises, as science met fiction one recent evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alison Watery, and I'm a scientist here at the Sanford Consortium. I'm also the director of the stem cell program here at UCSD. And uh, part of the reason why we are here is that um, some of the research that we do in this building is about using stem cells to recreate the human brain. And one of the questions that we ask is uh, if those uh, genetic variants that we see in our ancestral can actually be related to some of the neurological disorders that we uh, are aware, such as autism or susceptibility uh, to some neurodegeneration as well. So that's what we do here. But today is not about that. So today we have the pleasure to have uh, Tim Disney uh, to uh, introduce uh, his, late, his latest move, uh, William. We're going to all see that. And at the end, we're going to have a panel discussion with some faculty experts here at UCSD. So I'll let uh, Tim to introduce the movie, and then we can uh, all watch together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm just a filmmaker. To be in a room with a bunch of scientists and at this facility with all of you folks is a real honor and a pleasure. So thank you for having me. I'll say just briefly that the idea of this movie, for this movie, came from an interest in science. Uh, I got interested in the origins of Homo sapiens and uh, read some popular literature about it. Um, and I kept coming across the Neanderthals, of course, because they figure in the story. And uh, they were more or less written off in the same way, generally, that they did, died off because they, were, they didn't have that special thing that Homo sapiens had, some special creativity or language skill or whatever it was. And after a while, I found that irritating and um, got a little bit angry and defensive for the Neanderthals and thought, what if they died off because they were better than us, not worse than us? So that, to me, seemed like a useful um, starting point for a story uh, about otherness, what it's like to be different, how the world treats us if we're different, uh, both physically and cognitively. So that, that was really the essence of the movie. Um, one of the most interesting things about uh, making a movie is what everybody takes from it. You know, as, a, as the creator of it, I have an idea of what I'm doing, but I don't really know what I've done until people see it and, and uh, say it back to me. So thank you for this uh, amazing opportunity, and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Fossilized remains of a human-like creature were first discovered in the Neander Valley, hence the name Neanderthal. Imagine bringing to life our closest cousin. We start by removing the nuclear DNA and then replace it with DNA from the William specimen. Who's going to carry the embryo? I will. Congratulations, Mom and Dad. This is William, a healthy, week-old Neanderthal baby. Are you a proud father, Dr. Reed? Very proud indeed. The question here is what is best for William? Caveman, get back here. You're not a caveman. I know, I'm a Neanderthal. And that means that you are very special. Check it, yo. Eighteen in English. Not good. What did you get? Thirty-four. That's a very high score. <laughs> yeah, well, I was a total geek. His cognitive patterns don't match any recognizable model. It's not a question of intelligence. He's unique. Go to college like your classmates. Since the day he was born, you have tried to use him to prove something about yourself. We're holding him back. He looks like he wants to say something. Maybe he speaks through you. You're the guy from the university. That's very cool. <laughs> How do you like it out here, Will? I love it. William, you have a place. You embarrassed me in front of everyone in there. Your work is a failure. 
Why can't we call things what they are? Maybe we can get to a deeper truth? No, I think we can get further from the truth, not closer. So before we start, I, I think it's perhaps the, the best thing to do is just to introduce ourselves. Um, I think, I mean, I already introduced myself, Alison Watry, I'm a faculty here um, in uh, at the pediatrics department, and I am also the director of the stem cell program. And um, this is uh, Tim Disney. Yes, my name is Tim Disney. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a sometimes filmmaker. I'm also uh, an investor in uh, pharmaceutical development stuff and some other things, and I was in the software business for a while. I'm also the chairman of the board of CalArts, an art school, so I like colleges. Uh, and that's it. I'm Craig Callender. I'm a professor of philosophy. I do philosophy of science here at UCA San Diego. Um, and I'm also the founder and one of the directors of the new Institute for Practical Ethics, which is devoted to uh, you know, science for the common good. Hi, I'm Pascal Gagneux. I'm an evolutionary biologist and on the faculty of the pathology and anthropology department. I'm also uh, the associate director of CARTA, the Center for Academic Research and Training in Anthropogeny here at UCSD and SOC. I'm Caterina Semendeferi. I'm a professor of anthropology here at UC San Diego. I'm Rich Horner, and um, I'm a, a community activist leader uh, that's uh, in the process of building a, uh, a center for neurodiversity here at UC on the UCSD campus, a joint partnership with UCSD and RADI for children and families facing neurodiversity. All right, good. Um, so I don't think there is uh, any format or any way to, to, to start that, but um, I think I'll, uh, I'll just take advantage of uh, the expertise here and start asking some questions to the panel, and then we can open for discussion. I mean. This is uh, by no means to be format. We can just jump in and discuss. Um, Tim told me that although uh, the science uh, part is not really the main focus of the movie, uh, but it is a way to get started into the question of um, how uh, we would clone the Neanderthals. And I, I think perhaps starting here, I'll have like two questions. Uh, perhaps one uh, starting with Pascal, and then we go followed by an ethical question. And uh, one is. Uh, um, how possible uh, it is to clone a Neanderthal? What would be the limitations, the feasibility um, uh, on the science today? Um, and, and follow up by, I mean, how ethical would it be to clone a Neanderthal? So, great, great question. And clearly, your expertise in that field is far outpasses mine. By my, my understanding is that the, the big limitation with ancient DNA is that, in fact, to qualify as ancient DNA, Today, researchers do not consider anything that's longer than 50 base pairs long. It has to be broken into dust of DNA, or it's probably a modern contamination. So it would be an incredible find to find an intact genome, two times three billion base pairs, still wrapped around the histone, still in the intact chromosomes, to then do a, a nuclear transfer, not to mention also transferring the mitochondria. And I might add probably one of the things that, that is was really telling is, did you notice how, how rapid pregnancy was? <laughs> like that? Well, pregnancy involved fetal <laughs> tissue that is encoded by the paternal genome of the Neanderthal. And the fetal tissue in question is the placenta. And placentas in mammals are among the most rapidly evolving structures. So half a million year of divergence could very well be that this Neanderthal placenta might be barking up the wrong uterus. <laughs> that's that's, that's the, the, uh, the horror scenario. But obviously, there was interbreeding. So sometimes it did work. <laughs> ethical question. Would you like to comment on the ethical question? Yeah, I think uh, many ethical questions uh, get raised here. Um, one is, uh, which I think is dramatically portrayed here, uh, but if you think of uh, you know, existing de extinction uh, uh, attempts, you know, they're mostly about conservation. And so bringing back the woolly mammoth, bringing back the passenger pigeon. And now what are you doing that for? Is it going to be just a novelty to hang out in a zoo maybe? Or are you actually thinking about you know, it's, uh, what's, you know, the kind of context in which you're going to actually locate this? And so I think when you think ahead, you then can see that there are differences between different programs. And so arguably, you could say the, the north has lost its elephant. 
uh, adding an, you know, there are places where arguably it would, uh, could, could live and thrive in, in Russia. Uh, and that you could then uh, you know, have a keystone species which would really transform the ecosystem in some way that you might think of as positive, similar to you know, reintroducing the wolves in Yellowstone. On the other hand, you think of the passenger pigeon. So you know, if you look at reports of uh, the passenger pigeon flocks flying over the United States in the 1800s, you know, they would go by you know, a mile wide, 300 miles long, it would take three days sometimes for the, you know, for you to see the sun again. They were so big. That's not going to happen in the U.S. now. You know, you can't. People are not going to tolerate. That, well, a there's no tol there's no space for them, uh, but also people are not going to tolerate you know passenger pigeon flocks that go by for three days. Um, so then, what do you raise, you know what are you doing the passenger pigeon for then? Um, and so yeah, well, so one question is whether you know the thinking ahead about the, the product and where it's going to be and why you want to do that. And then, of course, another one is, you know, we heard the scientists say, you know, to make progress, you need to break rules. When I heard that, I was then imagining the uh, genetic engineer in China, he, who recently had, you know, uh, modified those twin babies to make them HIV resistant, but arguably without a necessary, you know, arguably wasn't necessary, and also arguably there was not meaningful informed consent uh, by the parents, certainly the children, you know, did not. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> prenatal. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, their spokes, their guardians, uh, were, you know, probably did not give inform what we would really consider meaningful informed consent. And so when I hear, you know, to make progress, we need to break the rules. I can see the rationale sometimes for that, but on the, you know, think of red tape and all that. But on the other hand, you can also think of some real dangers. All right. So I'll, I'll turn to this side now, and I'll, I'll ask Katerina to comment on um, what do we know about uh, the Neanderthal cognitive abilities? I mean, um, uh, and, and start with the first thing. I mean, when, when, when he say, mom, I mean, do, can they speak? So can I say something before I even address right. your question, just because I can hardly wait to, to say it. <laughs> um, I had fun watching the movie. It was great. Uh, but never, ever, ever would I support even remotely the idea of doing an experiment like that. I think this is wrong in every conceivable way. Um, we're doing science to, to help, to uh, relieve pain, to understand. But um, what I saw is pathological homo sapiensis being the central characters. A pathological in a very, very twisted way. Um, so let me just say that first. From all. I, I, I'll no. say I totally agree with you. It's a, yeah, I, I, I know yeah. you do. Because I, I think the, uh, uh, the, he himself answers that question at the end when he says uh, he doesn't belong here and neither do I. Right, right. I, I know you do. But, and that's why the movie is so interesting, because it raises all of these questions. And, and so setting that aside, yeah, let's go back to talking about what we think we know about Natterdals and how, uh, how they were cognitively organized. Well, we can only make inferences. And we make inferences based on the kinds of skulls that are there, because really that's all we have in terms of how the brains may have looked like in the side of the skull. We know they had big brains. So you don't really have a big brain if you're not going to use it. Brains are very expensive. They are very expensive energetically organs. So to have a big brain and do really nothing with it is, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense evolutionarily. It doesn't make any sense physiologically. So this older idea that Natalos were these broods, these cavemen, this um, never really made sense from the perspective of someone who studies the brain, like, like many of us do here. Um, so clearly, cognitively very complex creatures, uh, very, very similar to modern humans in the sense that they were able to produce and symbolize and have emotions and have representations based on the art they left behind, based on evidence for rituals they, they have. Um, and more recently, we have evidence from even genetic uh, analysis that point to the possibility that some of the genes that are involved in, in adults may uh, give some signature of, of complex uh, 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 developments of parts of the neurons and parts of the nervous system early in development. And that sets the stage for, 
possibly a, it's a different kind of brain, a, 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 another kind of a brain. Now, how is that and how they do that, we don't really know. And I definitely don't want to know the way that <laughs> we saw the movie. I had fun watching it, but uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, uh, I think that's um, one of uh, perhaps the goals of the movie is to inspire this kind of discussion, right? Uh, and um, let, let me go back to the ethicist. Is there uh, any way where this would be acceptable? Any condition or situation where <laughs> this would be uh, a, a green light? I'm a philosopher, and you know, we, we deal with all these sort of thought experiments and sci-fi, uh, completely unrealistic scenarios all the time. But it really strains <laughs> you know, the imagination to imagine, uh, you know, well, maybe if we you know, found a, a huge community of Neanderthals living on some island <laughs> or something, and we could put, put the Neanderthal there. Uh, but it's hard to imagine it, you know, unless you could have the right context, it's, you're just setting up, you know, it, it seems unethical, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's important for people who are outside academia that all these experiments, they pass through an ethical committee. And, um, and Tim touches that uh, when uh, the university was discussing with um, the scientists, I mean, to approve or not approve uh, the science. So it, it's way more complex than that. There are many um, instances where the, uh, the research has checkpoints uh, whether to go further or not. And just, just making clear that, I mean, we cannot just decide to do some experiments and, and, and go for it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask one, one question to Rich. Uh, which is um, what I think it's fascinating about the movie is that it's not only talking about this science fiction uh, 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 story with the Neanderthals, but I see as uh, an interesting point of discussion for the neurodiversity. So we do have modern humans who have mutations in their physical uh, characteristics or the cognition side uh, are different, are distinct from us. And, um, and we are getting better on uh, uh, not only tolerate, uh, but also uh, incorporate um, all these people so they can live in society. But we are we're not quite there yet. I mean, there are uh, steps where we need to improve. And that's my question to reach. I mean, how, how the neurodiversity gets into um, this question here? Yeah, no, that's, that's good. And I think in addition to the scientific morality, there's the social morality aspect of this, right? Because you think of our society, the pressure for conformance is immense. And you could see that in this movie. And what compounded it was the isolation of him being the only version like this on the planet. He was really alone. And so when you look at our society today, there's, as you mentioned, I mean, there's been some progress, right? Everyone's heard about inclusion. But inclusion really has, I think, three sides to it. Uh, side one is, and, and not to digress, but I think people confuse um, inclusion with conformance. And I mean, what does it say when we're a society and if you're different, there's so much pressure for you to abandon your difference and conform, right? And so I think a lot of people confuse inclusion with conformance. And really what I think inclusion in a situation like this, and the parallels you can draw to like autism, for example, is it's welcoming that individual into society. Warmth, welcoming, understanding, accepting, education about maybe the behavioral anomalies. And that's really what inclusion is. And then it gets into, there's three aspects, there's three dimensions. There's the include, there's, I, you can look at it from a push, a pull, right? The, the push might be the neurodiverse person working with experts in the field to understand how they can control maybe some of their abnormalities. But then there's working with mainstream society for them to understand that, that uh, neurodiverse condition so that they could communicate a little bit better and be understanding and welcome that individual into society. And I think probably one of the most important things, the third thing, and it came out in this movie, is for those individuals to be able to bond together as a community 
and not be alone. And um, so I, I think that's what I, I, I took away from this. It really reminded me of parallels today in our society with those individuals trying to go into the mainstream. Yeah, you don't have to clone an endertal to have those discussions, but, but that was an awesome way to, to attack the problem, right? Um, I wonder if you guys have questions. I mean, yep. I so I really did enjoy the movie uh, more than I thought I would. And uh, in other ways, maybe not as much as I'd like to. But Alice Moultrie, Alison Moultrie, you blew my mind in a CARTA uh, symposium when you mentioned that you were creating organoids, which are these <sighs> human organs that can be reproduced in a Petri dish, and you could reproduce the brains, and you created what you call Neanderthal brains, Neandertoids. And I was just, my brain was exploding at that time. And that you created them to be autistic. And then recently in a symposium of CARTA, again, I heard that there was, I think I remember hearing that there was uh, something about the Neanderthal brain that, that prevented it from autism. And so that was probably why you did that. Now, when I've mentioned this, that this man down the street created, uh, was growing Neanderthal brains, uh, people have brought up all these ethical questions. And you're a very charming, very smart man. Um, you, you faced all these questions that are in this movie. Uh, so what do you have to say about all that? <laughs> <laughs> so you put me on the spot. <laughs> all right. Uh, so let me just clarify one thing. Um, well, what we do is we, we generate these uh, brain organoids that start from stem cells. And uh, part of my research is uh, interested on, on brain evolution. So we compare the genome of Neanderthals with modern humans, and we, and we ask the question, what's unique about uh, the human genome? Uh, once we find those differences, we go to the human genome, and we Neanderthalize them by changing the DNA pieces that are human-specific back to our ancestrals. And from those cells, we go back and create the Neanderthoids or, or the Neanderthalized organoids, and then we compare. So uh, the, uh, I think uh, the mixing with autism is not, is not intentional. What we see is that some of the features of these Neanderthalized organoids reminds me when we generate brain organoids from autism. And we do that because we want to understand the causes of autism and finding better treatments. So it was a surprise that some of the features uh, seems uh, similar to autism. It, it, one might speculate, well, maybe the Neanderthals have problems with communications or, 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 or sociability, or they do it in a different way. We just can't tell. I mean, it's all very speculative. But that's what um, the research was about. Thank you. I also really enjoyed the movie. I was going to ask in terms of the ethicalness of it, cloning seems a rather crude way to bring a Neanderthal or another extinct species into the world. Do you think it'd be a little bit more ethical to use other methods such as selective breeding to slowly ease them into the world? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Uh, it would take a very long time. Uh, very, 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 very long time. I, I defer to... I would say yeah. the movie's only 100 <laughs> minutes long, so yeah. we didn't have time to... I, I might have a comment to that. So I remember uh, several years ago, Svante Palbo was visiting, and he was kind enough to come and we meet with some of the students uh, that, that do the uh, anthropology specialization. And he was all excited because it was shortly after they had sequenced the ancient, the complete genome of, of the Neanderthals. And uh, back then he was dreaming, he said, maybe we can get a really high quality Neanderthal genome by just sequencing enough humans outside Africa where there has been introgression and we'll put together a perfect Neanderthal genome. And last time I saw him last year, he said, you know, at a max, you would receive 40% of the Neanderthal genome because the other 60% have been shed. So that, there is both evidence of certain genes coming in and possibly contributing to humanness in some human populations, but there was mostly a signal that many Neanderthal genes 
might not have meshed perfectly with the Homo sapiens gene and were actually purged afterwards. So if you, that's uh, Svante's latest estimate is that there's only about 40% remaining. So you couldn't breed an Neanderthal because you couldn't retrieve the other 60% of the genetic variation. And I'll, I'll add to that, but we can fix your question by, by saying that what about the hybrid, right? I mean, perhaps we can create a hybrid or, or a human, a modern human with high content Neanderthal. Well, that's what so happens at the end. That's, that's the end of the movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. In some sense, this has kind of happened, but not really. I mean, so the, the quagga went extinct in 1883, I think. Uh, and so this is like a half zebra, half horse. So its back half is all these stripes. And there's a person in uh, South Africa who just kept breeding zebra, the most quagga-like zebras again and again and again and again and again. And then, uh, you know, in the early 2000s has these zebra that look just like quagga. They're not quagga because he's only going by phenotype, and so he's not getting that much. Presumably he's getting probably some genetic carry along of the quagga, uh, but he's not getting the, the full quagga. And you can tell this because the, so there's this particular one named Henry, and it looks very much like a quagga. But I, as I understand it, Henry's brothers and sisters just look like regular zebra. And so they haven't really, you know, it's kind of hit or miss. Uh, but anyway, in terms of the ethics, yeah, I mean, if it happened slowly enough, then it, then it might, you know, make the, you know, the, condi the social conditions such that it's maybe better, yeah. I'd like to add something if I can jump in here. So um, I think to me the question is not, um, only driven by what we can do, but what we are choosing to do. So it's not really about, is it the technology that is driving our questions, our future, our science, or is it us making some decisions as a, as a social species in terms of what it is really beneficial to pursue? So um, to me, that is a guiding principle. It's one thing to think of experiments like the cortical organoids that Alison and others are building uh, in the context of, well, how can we understand neurodiversity? How can we help uh, alleviate the suffering? How can we understand and reconstruct the evolution of our species? And it's a very different thing to just follow uh, X, Y, Z because we just happen to find this or because we happen to have the tools to do something. I, I, I think that this is the wrong way to go about it. I think Eric has a question. Or? Thanks very much. So a question for uh, Mr. Disney. Thanks so much for bringing your movie. It was really fun. So I wanted to ask you if you, when you consulted with scientists about this, that you found out that dad jokes were the, the superiority in human beings. <laughs> But um, you obviously really kind of had a loving uh, relationship to creating this story. And I wanted to ask you if you felt like you'd really like to meet a Neanderthal. Given all these other discussions, would, you, would this personality be somebody you'd like to meet? Um, well, I really love William, the character. I think he's a very compelling character. Um, I, you know, for me, it was always a, a literary idea, not a sci scientific one. It, it seemed to me a very um, useful and effective meta uh, way of getting at a story of otherness. Uh, you know, we, I live in a crisis moment, I think, in our culture around this. Um, uh, I didn't feel like I was the person to tell the story in the, the very literal way that you often see it told by people who are in a better position to do that than I am. Um, to me, I thought that his physical stature and presence is really important because he's considered uh, to be dangerous just at face value. Just his, his, his very physical being is a threat to people in the same way that a young African-American man in a hoodie is considered a, a, a dangerous figure without any other knowledge by a lot of people. Uh, so. If I presented that scenario, I think uh, it would have the polarizing effect so many things do now in our culture. We'd say like, oh, it's that, it's that thing. It's that scenario. You know, it's, it's uh, Jordan, uh, it's, uh, it's Michael Brown, it's the same thing. 
Uh, so I don't think that uh, provides much of an entry point for people to think about that story. Abstracting it in this manner maybe allows people to, th to think about it. You know, so that was, that was really the, the reason that I wanted to tell the story that way. It has lots of other stuff in it, too. It has the cognitive element. Somebody said to me, thanks for making a movie about standardized testing. That was not my goal when I set out. <laughs> um, uh, but that's in there, too. And then, uh, you know, when I started working on the story a long time ago, I had two teenage sons. And, uh, you know, a lot of it was about my own experience as a parent. Like, what teenage boy does not feel like a Neanderthal on some level, you know? It's a, it's a, um, and how I... I think I was saying to this when we were speaking before about when I would watch my children, my, my sons, behave in ways that were uh, antisocial. I mean, I don't mean that in a, in, a, in a severe way, but in ways that would provoke a negative reaction from the community, I would say, oh, you don't want to do that because you're going to upset people, you know, or I, I didn't want them to suffer or to suffer that. And so I wanted to squash that out of them, <laughs> you know? And so I became the oppressor in that relationship, like maybe all parents do with their children. So I was trying to get at something about that, some, you know, which is maybe why the parental figures are maybe a little too, too extreme. Uh, you know, I think maybe that's a weakness of the story. I was trying to have them be archetypal. Maybe that's a better euphemism for stereotypical. I don't know. Um, but I was trying to get at some, you know, real core parent-child stuff. You know, and, and just one last thought is, 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 is it's, it's a Frankenstein story. I mean, we make overt reference to that. Um, but I think that maybe every parent-child uh, relationship is essentially a Frankenstein story, and that's it. You create, this, you create this thing. You think of it in your own image. You want to raise it according to your own sensibility. How could you do otherwise? You know, because that's... And then they have other ideas. They're, 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 they're unique. They have their own ideas. They want to do their own thing. And, you know, and they're, in that sense, they are monsters. You've created this monster that go, go, go off. So it, it was something about that. Sure. So it really was about dad jokes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, for Allison, maybe Pascal and oh. Katrina, I have a question. Um, uh, Svante Pebo has said that one of the most important things that uh, Neanderthal, understanding Neanderthal can tell us is about ourselves. And if maybe you can comment on what some of those things might be that we could find out by understanding the Neanderthal genome better and through your work, Alison. Well, um, I think there are two things here. One is what is the contribution of uh, the Neanderthals to uh, the modern genome, right? I mean, what are the things that we capture from them and, and we use it in our advantage, and we are still learning. There are many things. Uh, there's a couple of examples already that uh, make sense and others that make not so many sense. Um, uh, but we are still learning on that. The other way to look at that, it is what are so unique about us, and, and that's what I'm trying to, to answer using the brain organoids story, especially on, on, on the brain side. Um, so these are, um, genetic variants that are uh, fixed or, or very conserved in the human population, but, but did not for the, our uh, ancestrals, um, uh, such as the Neanderthals or the Denisovans. So why is that? Are, are those genetic variants that um, made us uh, different in any ways? And, and, and if, it's, if it's such, what is the different? And what would be the advantage for our uh, modern humans to have that uh, genetic variance. So my perspective is more towards the genetics. Um, Kat and, um, um, and Pascal, if you would like to, to comment on your perspective on how the study of Neanderthals might help to understand this. Well, I would just like to add that uh, what uh, is fascinating from someone who has been doing comparative anatomy, uh, looking at brains of modern humans and brains of modern uh, relatives like the great apes, is, uh, well, what are the differences and what is it that we share with them? And from that perspective, it is fascinating to be able to have that control in the dish, in the experiments that Alison is doing, to, uh, to target specific genes or specific uh, uh, groups of genes and see, well, if you alter them, how is that brain tissue going to differ and behave and talk to each other than, than uh, would be expected if the gene was not affected? So in that context, in a very, very localized and specific context that can take the structure 
hand in hand with the function. It is, is a fascinating and very promising way to go to understand why it may have been guiding the growth of the natural brain in different ways than the human brain. So that is what is the appeal. But really to end up with an entire individual uh, like, uh, like uh, was portrayed in the movie. So I, I might want to add that trying to understand ourselves has this inherent built-in uh, attempt to, um, to look for, you know, things that are flattering and different human groups want to come up on top. That's, that just seems to be a pattern. And so it's really important to appreciate that th when the first Neanderthal genome was published, the French newspapers reported, aha, the little 2% of je ne sais quoi, of French genius. <laughs> the same day in Ivory Coast, the newspaper said, now we know what the, these, the white people are such bastards. <laughs> uh, so, so modern humans are out of Africa, walked out of Africa 70,000 years ago. They did interbreed, but all of Africa is full of modern humans. I've never met a non-modern person in Africa, and they do not have those 2% of Neanderthal. They have some other archaic introgression, which is super interesting. So the story is complicated, but modern humans did not become modern humans because of Neanderthal introgression, unless you want to throw the African continent under the bus, which I wouldn't be willing to do. So the movie is called William. How would the plot have been different if it had been Wilma? And uh, we, we tend to have, an, I don't know, an engendered portrayal of Neanderthals. And I, I'm not sure that I've ever seen any kind of portrayal of a woman Neanderthal. Uh, I'm curious. The Kenneth brothers made, for National Geographic's made a wonderful Wilma holding a spear, and she was to going, going to go on the cover, but because it's National Geographic, when they show that after three months of hard work, the photographer came to take a photograph, said, oh no, you have to move the spear, we can't show the nipples. <laughs> so, so they only showed her head on the cover because National Geographic was afraid of silicone nipples of an extinct hominin, you know, it's, <laughs> it's too bad. And the, the reconstructions were very, very amazing. She has we used that photo on the Carta Symposium on Human Imagination. So it, it's there, it's a very beautiful portrait. Yeah. If I'd had daughters, perhaps I would, would have made that story. So. so I'd like to add something to that. It's, uh, uh, I'm glad that a gentleman brought up the gender issue because uh, as I was watching the movie, I was thinking, well, what a primate story this really is in terms of the reaction of the female scientist to that growing uh, uh, dependent uh, as opposed to the father figure. So, and I, I'm sure this was not an accident the way you put it together, but we are social animals and we raise our offspring on, on our own. Females are the ones who carry the babies and they raise the babies and they are in charge of protecting them from aggression within the troop, across the troop, um, finding the food, getting them to independence. So to me, it was fascinating that the father figure seemed to be so emotionally disconnected completely from the whole process and how the female scientist reacted to that. So I don't want to say any more than that, but I was fascinated the, the, the by The father figure loved him to the extent he reflected back to him what he wanted from him, mm -hmm. you know, which I guess is you know, fatherhood at its worst in the modern sense, but very traditional. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Very nice movie. Um, we're focusing on the genome here, but what about nature's versus nurture? So I wouldn't, I mean, if, if I was put in that situation, probably I would be, have a very similar reaction. Um, so I don't know if it's an evolutionary development of biology or anthropology kind of question, but anybody wants to comment well, on that? I'll, I'll, I'll let Tim comment on that because we, we discuss some of those ideas and the environment and the nature. Well, I, I think the hardest thing about writing it was conceiving of the cognitive difference. So I didn't really care about the science part of it in that. I was just trying to come up with something that served the story. So that, that's how I arrived at and with my co-writer, how I arrived at, at that place. But for how we represented him physically and behaviorally, we just thought, uh, let's be as realistic as we possibly can. So he's not, he can't lift cars or do ridiculous things. He's somewhat stronger, but not absurdly so or comedically so. Um, we assumed that 
most of Neanderthal behavior was learned in the same way that ours is, so why would he know how to hunt? He wouldn't naturally know how to hunt. I mean, he, he grew up in a normal school, so he would just, and he very much, you know, it, it, going back to the character part of it, he wanted to, a connection. That's what he wanted more than anything. And uh, so he tr was trying to behave in a sapiens-like way. He wanted to be part of the tribe, you know, until he finally realized that uh, that it was impossible for him to do that. That the story had been written about him and it was such a strong story, it so overwhelmed him that he ended up, in spite of himself, acting his part in it. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I, mean, I was just wondering yeah, how much, if in a different context, it would actually, not knowing that it was a Neanderthal, it would actually not be that different. From. Yeah, it's, exactly which I, I just thought of as trying to be as realistic as possible about it. I couldn't help noticing that, again, back to the birth scene, that if it had been at UCSD, a baby-friendly hospital, it would have been immediate skin contact with mom and breastfed. <laughs> she was feeding the bottle in all protective gear and because of the fear of contamination. So, but this, the breastfeeding would have been, and we don't know what lactation time was in the Neanderthals, uh, because that's not reflected in the, in the fossil record. But in, in humans without agriculture, it's almost three years. So breastfeeding would have been potentially a huge way to convey the microbiome and so forth, right? I mean, there were a whole lot of science things. I mean, movies are short. You have, don't have much time to explain anything. That, yeah. And, you know, we just, so I apologize <laughs> for, there, there's one line in particular that I'm very sensitive to where he's saying some techno gobbledygook at the press conference and the, the, one of the reporters asks, well, what does that mean? He says, it means he's good to go. He's good to go. That's all you need to know as the audience. He's good to go. Uh, but you know the infectious disease thing. I think that probably, if we open the door to that, uh, there would be no end to that. I just think he would probably die immediately. Probably. No, incidentally, that's one example where there is recruitment of HLA alleles yeah, I, I have that, read that, that yeah. defend people who have some Neanderthal DNA against some pathogen we don't haven't identified yet. But it's it, it made it in and it was kept because it was very useful. So that's interesting. Hi, thank you all. Um, this has been so interesting. I had a quick question going back to what you said at the beginning about when um, the ethical um, checks and balances that happen along the way when you're trying to um, conduct research. And I was wondering if that is just, um, is, is there something universal in without uh, throughout the US or does it go university by university? How are those decisions made? And then how is what's happening ethically in the US different from what is happening in other countries. Would you like to, to do that? Well, maybe you could start about the IRBs, I guess. Yeah, and, I mean, yeah. yeah, we do have like a, um, uh, a fair number of <laughs> forms and reports that we have to, to fill it out explaining the science and, and especially if it involves human subjects, then it's a very sensitive issue because then you need a consent form. So you need to recruit that subject and, and ask if they want to participate on the research. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, there are um, uh, uh, kind of universe, universal rules on, 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 on ethic conducts for research that we try to follow, and this has been improved over the years, um, and, um, and we are all subject to that. I mean, um, there are places in the world where this may be more flexible than others, uh, but overall, I mean, we follow s certain things that um, we agree upon, and, and it's uh, universal. Yeah, I'll just add that you know, yeah, so all the, each university has their, you know, uh, IRB uh, process, but that's not really like a place for deep ethical reflection. It's a little bit more, I mean, it's looking out for harm and making sure there's informed consent, but there's not, especially when you think about new technology and that, um, you know, so, you know, are, are you, when you're gonna, you know, so right, I was just running a conference on, uh, you know, the, the gene drive. So this is a way of passing on traits in a very powerful way that has non-Mendelian statistics. Uh, so the offspring, the trait always gets passed on to the offspring. Um, you know, now there's not really like, uh, you know, so who's in charge of that? Then the different organizations in the US, you know, fight over who's in charge. Is it EPA? Is it, uh, you know, which, which federal agency has this? Um, yeah, so we're talking about genetically modi releasing gen genetically modified bugs, for instance. So who, who, who gets to decide that question? 
Um, and so it's obviously a big question if you're going to do it. And so somebody should decide, and there should be some <coughs> discussion about that kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, so I don't think that those things replace that. And so I, that, uh, really what I'm just trying to do is plug my institute, uh, the <laughs> Institute for Practical Ethics, uh, where you know, we can talk about those sorts of things. Um, but sometimes you know, this, the scientists themselves will form together and come up with a kind of set of uh, rules that aren't really, aren't really binding. So that happens now with genetic modification of human beings, uh, but that's you know in the U.S. and then you know in the with the case with the twins in China, you can see that other countries may not follow that. that. In, in uh, I'm sorry, just I, I did a little research about you know the Nevada thing came from something, which is that as I understand it, and maybe it's changed, um, there is no national ban on human cloning. That it's been taken up in the Congress multiple times. And because it got folded into other arguments and they can't agree on anything, that, that's never been enacted at the national level. Most states have a prohibition on human cloning, but uh, uh, Nevada does not. Maybe one comment on the drive. So I don't, I don't think I've ever come across the idea that one thing that could have caused the extinction of the Neanderthal could have been a meiotic drive element for modern humans. Uh, when you cross species that, in fact, the whole phenomenon of speciation due to incompatibility of the genomes, it's called the, the Müller-Dobjanski model of speciation, is that as populations evolve apart over hundreds of thousands of years, each genome is fighting a host parasite co-evolutionary arms race between transposable elements and ways to silence them. And so in a hybrid, this can break down and suddenly the element just goes throughout your genome. But uh, it would be impossible to dig up, uh, you know. But, but it's, it's an idea I have never thought of, so I, I need to spend some time considering it. A non-scientific question. What was with all the singing? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I mean, just the idea of a Neanderthal doing Gilbert and Sullivan was funny and entertaining. I mean, it's a movie. I mean, I, that's my retort to any criticism the scientific community has. It's a movie. <laughs> This has been a great discussion. Is one more question? If we can have one more question, the last one. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, like, what about what would you think the plot would be? Would it be different if it was William's situation, but vice versa? So, like, a human coming into a Neanderthal world? That's a good question. <laughs> do you do you want it? Do you want it? I, I, perhaps I can start because there is, uh, that, that question reminds me of one of uh, the Cosmos episode when um, uh, Carl Sagan asks the question, if I could go back in time, where would I go? And he said, oh, I'll go back to the Library of Alexandria because that's where all the knowledge of the ancient world was uh, all located in there and then was destroyed. So I would have a peep on that. And, and I would go back to meet the Neanderthal. So I would love to do that. <laughs> and see, I mean, how they interact, I mean, uh, understand uh, what's, what's going on in their minds. To me, it would be a, a fascinating trip back in time. Um, yeah. Oh, maybe I'd just uh, take your question and then think of the metaphor, and you could also imagine a neurotypical in an environment of just, you know, ADD uh, people or right. that, uh, which would be super interesting to think about. Uh, That's the sequel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I think we uh, end here. So I thank the panelists. I'll, I'll thank you guys uh, for sticking around. I'll thank uh, all uh, the uh, people who helped to organize, Jake, Marcy, uh, people from the Clark Center and the Stem Cell Program. Um, so thank you all.